Okay, so we've built these projects. Now the concern we have is we have to operate them, right? And a, a big part of that is, uh, you know, if we're going to like a do it do a day ahead unit commitment of the system and so forth, it'd be really nice to know exactly how much power we'll get from every wind and solar plant tomorrow, right? And so how, how do you start doing that? Uh, obviously we're gonna build on the weather forecasting we talked about, but there's more to it than, than just taking the weather forecast itself. We talked about these weather models earlier here, and um, you know, I also mentioned that there's more than one available, and we'll come back to that as well, because it turns out to be very useful that you can get several of these, uh, and, and we'll talk about why that is the case. But assume, first of all, you just have one model, and you're trying to produce a wind power forecast, the power at the meter is what we're after here, right? Uh, the, uh, the, the thing you usually also have is a wind speed measurement at the site. You've usually kept, uh, hopefully kept that MET tower up, so you've got a measurement of wind speed, uh, and you also get some of that data from the, the equipment on the turbines today. And so to start with, you might actually just take that, that wind speed value or take a forecast and extract the wind or pull the wind speed off the internet even and say, well, I get the, an approximate wind speed. I just kind of run that through the power curve and I multiply it by the number of turbines and I've got a rough approximation of my power. Turns out that's pretty rough right, because it's not taking all those wake losses and other things into account very well. So it's in the ballpark, but it's gonna have a very high error rate. So you wanna do better, and you say, well, as I operate that plant, say, say I run that plant for six months or so, and now I've got the archive of my historical measurements of the wind speed from my MET tower at that site, and I've got an archive over the last six months of the forecast that I wanna use as well. So intuitively, the way you think you do it is, you know, if I can just forecast wind speed very accurately, then I can turn that wind speed into power. And a lot of people do it that way, at least initially some, some vendors out there do actually use this method and it, it can work okay. So you find this relationship, you take that archive of the weather forecast data, which has not just the wind speed variable near your location, but it might have, you know, from, from multiple locations in that 3D matrix around the site, it might have multiple levels in there. It, you might also wanna look at variables other than just wind speed and direction out of the model because things like the thermal stability type uh, variables, you know, are all gonna play here in complex ways. And often now you'll take that and you'll use uh, some sort of uh, machine learning, like a, a artificial neural net or one of these, you know, mathematical um, computational learning system type methods that we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute to find this complex relationship between a set of the variables from the forecast and the wind speed variable you're after, right? And you'll find this relationship. And then once you've determined, once you've kind of learned that relationship historically, then you can take a new forecast coming in for tomorrow, for example, you can apply that wind speed relationship and find a, a forecasted wind speed, and then you can just turn that into a power forecast. Okay, well the problem with that is this just turning it into power forecast also is another of these complex problems because of all the, the interactions going on between turbines and so forth. So it turns out that the only, the only downside of this sort of approach is that you not only have to do a very good historical training of wind speed to the, uh, the predicted wind speed from the models, but then you've got to figure out, okay, given a, a particular type of, of wind speed and direction, how well can I turn that into power? So you've got these multiple errors that can kind of multiply with each other and, and give you a higher error rate. So we actually did a lot of work on this and others have, and, and some of us now say, well, this is great, but I really don't care about predicting wind speed. I don't get paid for wind speed, I get paid for power at the meter. So what if I just kind of said, instead of looking at the power, I've got that same sort of historical data set for six months or uh, preferably a year of the actual power at the meter or sometimes at the individual turbines. And I've got the, this, this weather uh, forecast model, same time period. I kind of put all these variables in there and I let this, this advanced learning system type method find the significant relationships that allow me to do the best possible power forecast by throwing a lot of these variables, you know, all the, the points around it, the thermal stability and everything. And I worry, worry about optimizing this forecast to power output relationship. What I'm doing here, I'm doing this, is I'm actually learning the personality of the wind plant. Because it, it's gonna change. Every, every direction of the compass is going to be different in terms of how the wind plant behaves for the same wind speed, right? Because that changes all the interactions going on. So you really find this personality of the wind plant, and then of course, it's very trivial to say, okay, I get a new weather forecast, I then run it through this relationship and I get my power output. 
So you've, you've built more intelligence into this learning step uh, of going directly to power and you use that. Both methods work, you know, diff different companies out there use different ones. But this is why, for example, uh, uh, MISO, the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, they have a centralized wind forecast that's done for them by a, a company out of Germany. Uh, very good company, they, and they do this method. Uh, and uh, they're not even asking for, at this point, for any MET data from the project. They're just, they, they've got all their power data at the meter. Uh, the company has their weather forecast models, and they're able to do this training and come up with this forecast for the MISO system, you know, just based on power data. What you need here, what you really matters is you know, power, availability, and curtailment, all focused on the power side of things. And they just figure out this relationship going back to the weather models. It turns out that uh, you know, these weather models, of course, are not perfect. And what you're doing by this training process is you're, you're removing any consistent biases in the models, and you're finding these relationships. And it also happens to be very handy to have multiple forecasts, right? Because uh, they will all be kind of representing the laws of physics of the atmosphere in a slightly different way, may have a slightly different way of viewing the input data. They might not agree with each other, but that turns out to be useful too. And why is that? Well, suppose I've got three different forecast models. They're going to come up with a similar but not identical forecast for tomorrow, right? You know, wouldn't it be great if I had a way of blending those together and uh, using these, this machine learning methods to say, okay, under which circumstances does one model work better than the others? Or is some combination of the variables from these telling me something? And you can actually do this, where you, you use this machine learning, these applied math methods, and you try to minimize the, the error of whatever sort of forecasting function you're after, whether that's uh, reducing the average error, or trying to forecast ramp events where you get more rapid changes or whatever you try to optimize on. And uh, then if you get more forecasts in the future, you can add more into this. Th this is a process called ensemble forecasting. And it turns out that even if you just take kind of a simple average of several models, you tend to get a lower average error from that than you do off of any individual model itself. But you can do a lot better than that if you actually get more sophisticated with these applied math type optimization methods, okay? More than that, it, it turns out that these models don't always agree with each other. And that's interesting and useful because that gives you some indication of your certainty around the forecast, right? So if it's a, a weather event uh, and all the models are agreeing with each other, then that's telling you, okay, this is a pretty, it's a, it's a predictable type of weather system. You know, all of them kind of think they know what's going on. I probably have higher confidence in the weather forecast for that. Whereas if I see, you know, three or four models and they're diverging saying, well, okay, they're not stupid, they're all doing the best they can, but they can't agree on what's going to happen here, which means it might be a, a more complex weather system that's going to be less predictable. Of course, this is also influenced by, you know, where you are in the power curve. I mean, we love it if, uh, okay, is, it, is the wind speed going to be, you know, 35 or 40 miles per hour because we're on the flat part of the power curve where it doesn't matter if the, the forecast has air, right? Whereas if you're on that steep part, any little, any little uh, difference of opinion is going to be magnified. So you can put this, this probability distrib distribution around the forecast, come up with these predictive intervals, and that's useful because when you actually turn that into a, like a delivery to a control room here or a trading floor, then they can actually look at a, like a P20 to P80 sort of band around there and say, you know, I'm 80% sure I'm going to have at least this lower shaded level, uh, you know, and I think on average we'll have the solid line, you know, but how sure are you? Is that going to change your trading strategy? Is that going to maybe change how you look at setting up for tomorrow afternoon with reserves, you know, based on the level of confidence? So this is one useful input to this sort of uh, probabilistic forecasting. So you can actually come up with these whole, these probability clouds, you know, challenges, okay, what, what do you want to do with them? A lot of our tools are pretty deterministic and don't, you know, can't just take a, a whole probability distribution today, but people are definitely doing research on probabilistic unit commitment you know, multi-scenario type tools, other things like that that are, are certainly at least in the research or, or going on in some of the, uh, the EMS vendors and so forth looking at this sort of technology. So you can get weather power, you know, wind power forecasts from lots of different vendors. It's a, it's a global marketplace, lots of competition today. 
Uh, most of the ones that are you know, considered state of the art would always use multiple weather forecast models with this sort of ensemble approach. They would have some sort of computational learning or statistical step. You know, physics modeling takes you so far, then you, you learn from the data itself through this, this data mining. And then also, I'll talk more about this, they're going to use smart persistence because even these weather models really, they, they take time to run. You've got to get the data, you've got to crunch it on the computers, you've got to look at the output and make a decision with it. Okay, for the next five or 10 or 15 minutes, because of that huge mass of the atmosphere we talked about, you know, the, the wind power output doesn't tend to change very much over 10 minutes, really. It's more over the you know, tens of minutes and hour type time frame. So persistence, meaning whatever the power is right now, is actually an extremely good forecast for what it's going to be 10 minutes from now. It has very low error. In terms of how well these numerical weather models will do for like a day ahead would be, you know, making a forecast right now for tomorrow afternoon. Uh, I think that kind of the, the, the industry state of the art right now is probably in the 12 to 14, 15 percent mean absolute error as a percentage of the nameplate of the wind plant for an individual wind plant. What that means is that if it's a 100 megawatt wind plant, the average error of the forecast for tomorrow afternoon, you know, at 1 o'clock, would probably be, you know, about plus or minus 12 megawatts, right, in power output. They tend to do it that way rather than doing it as a percentage of, you know, actual scheduled energy just because sometimes the wind output is so low. Like, it, you know, the wind output might only be 9 megawatts tomorrow if the wind's not blowing much, you know, or something. So that can kind of distort, you know, how you're trying to do a, a calculation of error. Now, when you aggregate this over a larger region, a lot of the forecast error goes away, as well as a lot of the variability smooths out. Uh, the forecast error goes away because a lot of the errors in the forecast are like timing errors about, okay, exactly how quickly did that front move through or other sort of random movements in the atmosphere. And those sort of things will average out if you've got, you know, a dozen plants spread out over a couple states rather than just look at one plant. And in fact, uh, you get up to about half of that error actually goes away by just looking at a larger, you know, power pool here. MISO reports their system-wide wind error now is about 6%, you know, about half of what you see at an individual plant. And that's just from this aggregation. They're not, they're not doing anything different here other than just aggregating a lot of these together. And there's a lot more work going on. I mean, we're going to continue to improve the forecasts that are driving this, and that's going to help. Uh, we're also focusing, though, on, you know, you might care about not just the average error. You might be more concerned about ramps. You know, when is that output going to change dramatically? Can you time that? Can you tell us how much? It's tricky, but there's a lot of work on that we'll talk about. Uh, and a lot of it is, you know, how you use it. It's can we get this into our tools? Uh, can we, you know, the real low-hanging fruit I'll talk about later is can you actually get the market rules and the operating decision points to align with the points where the forecast actually has the best skill and get the low-hanging fruit benefit out of that. If you look at this system-wide, uh, this, is, this is actually from Alberta, from a friend of mine up there. What we're looking at here is uh, a, a forecast starting at time zero, running out for several hours. This uh, green line is the forecast you get from kind of a state-of-the-art numerical weather model-based forecasting service, right? Uh, and the pink line is persistence, meaning I'm just assuming whatever the output was at time zero, that's what is going to be going out forever. And you'll notice that numerical weather models, like we've been talking about, have huge benefit after you know, starting with the first few hours going out. And this stays surprisingly flat for the next couple of days. So uh, a one-day or even a two-day forecast is pretty good, but it's in this system-wide error of you know, 6 or 8%, like for an ISO-type system. The pink line definitely is a lot, lot worse once you get out a few, few hours, but if you're talking about within the first 15 minutes or so, it's very difficult to beat that persistence with a numerical weather model approach because of the reasons I talked about. And the interesting point is the error is really, really low as you approach time zero, right? Because it's not going to change that fast. So this is an important issue we'll talk about, especially when it comes to integrating into uh, markets. Now, is there more work? Yes, sir. Just a quick question around that. Yeah, Brad. Is there some practical limit of, you know, in other words, is it ever practical to be at zero? You know, get to a point where you understand it so well that you have a zero percent deviation, or is there some practical limit around? Well, 
if you're if you're talking about like like a day ahead or four hours ahead or whatever, uh, the the forecast will never be zero because of the complexity of the atmosphere and just the uh, the uh, the randomness that goes into that. There's a, there's a certain level of chaos theory in here in the atmosphere, right? So uh, we can get it. We'll, we'll gradually work to get it down, but. Uh, the, the, the simplest way to get to a zero error forecast is to actually, as we'll talk about, be dispatching your wind plant like uh, two minutes ahead of time, and then you're down where you're very close, right? And that's the simplest way to reduce the error is to, to look at how you actually schedule it into the market. If you can, if you get the market rules or the operating practices to allow you to do that. In fact, the, I mean, we're going to work on getting that forecast towards zero, but it's going to be a slow, gradual, evolutionary process. There's lots of money and research going into improving the underlying forecasts that drive those numerical weather model forecasts. Uh, we're in a project right now with Department of Energy funding, working with NOAA with their research labs on rolling out a new, a new forecast that they have, which actually runs every hour with the latest data at very high resolution. But it only runs out for the first uh, 12 or 15 hours. Yeah. So this would tell us you know, for, the, for this afternoon, can I do a better job of predicting those thunderstorms or the, you know, what's going to happen over the next four to six hours? Uh, and, and we are seeing some benefit with that. Uh, it's going to help, but uh, you know, it's not going to like, cut the air in half. It's going to maybe reduce it by 5%, right? So worth doing. Uh, but there's lots of people working on this, you know, uh, because weather models, of course, are not just used by the power system. They're used by aviation. They're used by road weather. They're used by everybody every day and making their decisions about business. Uh, you know, so it has huge economic value to improve weather forecasts, which is why it's done as a public service here in the uh, U.S. Uh, and they're working on this. But, you know, do you do, you do it with better physics, with more data, uh, higher resolution, running them more frequently? Should we deploy an entire sensor network of those expensive LiDAR devices all across the country? I mean, all those things are being discussed in terms of what's the cost benefit of doing that. Uh, but it's, it's not cheap, and uh, there's no, this, no silver bullet that's going to you know, cut forecasting error in half overnight by any means. But it will be ongoing work. The other thing I, I'd mentioned, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could just, uh, if we have a wind plant and we want to know what's going to happen, say, uh, in 30 minutes, just uh, you know, put a Met Tower uh, 20 miles upwind and measure the speed and expect it to get here. And we talked about all those vertical issues going on here in the last session about why that doesn't really work that way very well. I mean, it does help in like a major uh, cold front, a frontal passage, or a major synoptic storm, meaning a, a storm system coming through. It'll help you refine the timing a little bit. But the vast majority of the ramps that we see, this is an analysis of all the wind ramps from a major wind site. Vast majority are driven by these vertical issues, uh, convective things like thunderstorms. Uh, vertical mixing, you know, how quickly does that change over the day when I showed you that example? A uh, low-level jet, you know, when does it set up so those really high-speed winds from above actually come down so low they start getting into the turbine-swept area, right? Those you just can't do with just ground-mounted measurement devices, out in sensors, unless you get put in those really expensive LIDAR and radar profilers and things like that, but it gets pretty expensive. Now there's, you know, and that's the problem is, uh, you know, like we got the satellite system taking pictures everywhere every half hour, right? But you can't exactly see the winds Winds are invisible for the most part. Not always, though. This is just one example where you actually, curious example where you could see it. This shows up better if you look at your printed output. But I mean, obviously, you can see the clouds, but you're also seeing a big brown area if you look at the image there. That's actually a case in the Texas Panhandle where the winds were so strong it was a dust storm. It was picking up so much dust, you can actually see it from space. But it's not very often we can actually see, you know, dust fronts and storm fronts with a, from a wind point of view. But we can see the clouds, which helps us an awful lot on solar, which is what we're going to talk about next, okay? Make sense? Yes, sir? Speaking of Texas, I was told of an incident where they had, um, they were depending on wind energy in, in, in Texas and the wind collapsed. Yeah. Someone, the, the person told me that now they require their fossil fuel plants to be on at a minimum load to quickly be able to cover if the wind collapses again. So the question is about the Texas event a few years ago uh, where 
they, they uh, got close to a, a critical situation where uh, they, they had a wind, wind falling off. Yeah, the, uh, I'm familiar with the event. I, I, I don't think it's a case where they're, they're running all their units at, at MIN, uh, but what happened, the reality of that was that they had not yet started using the wind forecasting system. They had one prototype running in the back room that they were about to start. So first of all, it wasn't, they were not using a wind forecasting system like we're talking about here. And uh, I know we, we're running forecasts for Texas and the other company they, they contract with also picked that up. You know, it was a very forecastable, large cold front moving through. But it was kind of a, it was kind of a comedy of errors here kind of thing because uh, as I understand it, it was a big cold system moving through that was actually pretty easy to predict. But uh, they had, uh, the winds that didn't fall off instantly. I mean, it takes a long time to go across Texas. So it was like over six hours they lost, you know, quite a bit of, a couple thousand megawatts, I think. But the, the load forecast was also way, way off. So the load forecast had missed it too somehow. And then they called on a lot of thermal plants to start up, uh, and a lot of them could not start, you know, on, uh, for, for, for uh, gas plant startups. So they ended up in a bad case because they really weren't paying attention to weather forecasting very well is the bottom line. I mean, it was not a difficult system to see in the, in the weather models. But you do have to, you know, that's the critical issue. You, you have to look at this stuff carefully both day ahead and, you know, four to six hours ahead and adapt your system, you know, based on changes to this. The other interesting thing to point out there is that, you know, it's, it's not like the load forecast and the, the rest of the system operating characteristics are independent of the wind forecast, right? They're all driven by the same weather. So you really have to increasingly start looking at this whole system operation as a unified forecasting problem. So I think within a few years too, we'll see a lot more going on with load forecasting and combined, you know, integrated power system forecasting that includes wind, solar, load, other, other weather variables like, uh, you know, the efficiency of a thermal plant varies with, with wind speed and dew point, right? You know, for the coolers, things like this. So we have to look at this as a unified problem and you can't, you can't ignore weather. Uh, clearly you can't ignore weather once you get a lot of wind and solar on the system in particular. And that's probably driving us toward a better place in the long run, right? But yeah, you, you, have, to, you have to know what's coming, which is why forecasts have value. Yes, Terry. More wind development in Ohio and Indiana, and they've, they've got state policy reasons, they've got yeah. transmission reasons. But is there anything you're seeing from the analytical techniques that are giving them a leg up? Is something changing? There? You're talking about wind in, in Indiana, Ohio. Uh, yeah. Kind of these are these are areas that don't have the quality of the wind resource we have, like in the in the Dakotas, for example. Uh, but we're seeing a lot of wind projects built down there. Uh, you know this this totally becomes a trade-off of transmission capacity because when we're building a, a wind project, you, you have to have good wind resource, but you also have transmission capa capacity to get it to market. You gotta have a customer who wants to buy it, right? Or use it, integrate it. Uh, so the trade-off there, you build a project like in Indiana, the winds are not as good, but you're closer to load. You may have transmission capacity. So we will actually put it on taller towers in order to get to the numbers you need just to produce much energy there, but it, it can, you know, if the, if the power, price of power is more valuable there and you can deliver it, then that's what's moving projects closer to these load centers and to areas that are not the ideal wind resource. Now, if, uh, if you can build me some HVDC lines between here and uh, Indiana, you know, we could probably do it a lot cheaper for them. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, you can build wind projects a lot more quickly, as we were talking about, than you can a, a transmission line, right, which you know very well. Uh, but it's a trade-off. Yeah. Yeah. Question is about optimizing the the microsiding and how you how you lay up projects and turbines. Yeah. We like today. I mean, we're, we we run you know maps across the entire country now at very very high resolution just to find you know areas of interest. You know, the, the the wind development team will then you know overlay that with where's there a customer, you know, where's their transmission, uh, other variables about, you know, is there a business case for putting a project in this site versus that site. And then once, the, you know, once you know about where you're going to put it, then you'll, put the, you'll deploy those on-site measurement instruments to start getting more data. You'll start crunching this down to very high resolution. We'll be modeling, you know, early preliminary arrays. We'll be then doing an optimized array. 
and then uh, of course you get into the project then okay well this this owner just pulled this landowner just pulled out or this one needs another turbine or he won't be in you know you change the project uh, dimensions that changes the layout of the turbines then you get on the field you say well that's great that's a, that's a nice optimal plan you weather guys just gave us but I can't put a turbine here because of you know geotech reasons or you know nobody told us there was really that ditch there it didn't show up you know so it changes constantly but you end up with a project that is you know optimized as best as you can and, and yeah we're, we're doing we're using lots of data to do that now so it's getting better all the time still not perfect but uh, it's getting a lot better than it was 10 years ago So let's switch gears a little bit, talk about solar. There's uh, a lot going on in solar here in Minnesota. Uh, new legislation we'll talk about uh, creates a, a requirement to, uh, to increase our solar between now and 2020 as well. So we, uh, we haven't seen a whole lot of solar here in this part of the country, but uh, this is pretty relevant. Uh, turns out there's several different types of projects of solar. Uh, this is a solar trough project out in the desert southwest. These have been around since the 80s. Some new ones are being built. Uh, these, these basically focus the sun, in this case, on a, on a glass tube filled with a special oil. You create this superheated oil, which you use to create steam, run it through a, a steam generator just like you would with a coal plant. Uh, so that's a concentrating solar thermal project. There's other types that heat up molten salt on a tower where they reflect all the salt up to a point and do it with molten salt, similar thing. And the top left, that's a 25 megawatt on the AC side PV site you know, down in South Central Florida called the Soto Project. Covers about 180 acres. I mean, uh, one megawatt of PV will cover at least four acres completely uh, with the current efficiency of, of PV panels. And then, of course, we're seeing a lot of distributed PV. Uh, this is probably a, a neighborhood, I would guess, down in the uh, San Diego area where you know, every project goes in automatically has panels put on the roof, you know, and we're seeing a lot of these added. Uh, there's pros and cons to, to all these. Uh, uh, just to, to point out, the, as we discussed already, that the difference with these projects is if it's a concentrating, we, we care about only the direct beam. The PV panel doesn't care where the photon came from as long as it hits the panel, right? Uh, so a couple interesting things there. Uh, haze and, uh, and uh, humidity actually become important particulates in the atmosphere and so forth, because that will increase the amount that you get reflected there rather than direct beam. So you're only going to do these concentrated projects out you know, where the, the sun is pretty intense and the air is pretty clean. So most of those are going to be in the desert southwest. Around here, we would most likely do, P P do PV projects because it's more tolerant of our humidity and our, our storms. The other thing that's interesting is that it also reflects off of clouds. So as a big cloud bank is coming toward a PV site, You'll, just before the cloud gets to you, you'll actually see a slight uptick in power output before the cloud shadow hits you because the sun is reflecting off the cloud down to the panel, right? So a lot of things to think about with this. We can actually tell the difference uh, even on uh, which side of Phoenix is this project on. We'll see a different solar irradiance value because people water their lawns in the city. That increases the humidity on one side of the, the city versus the other that will be detectable in terms of the amount of haze you have out there and, and how the direct beam is affected. So it's tricky. As I mentioned, clouds are the biggest issue here. And uh, once you get up to above uh, 10, 20 megawatts, you're covering such a large area that uh, in many cases on a partly cloudy day, like a you know, puffy cumulus cloud kind of day, the, uh, the clouds will actually be smaller area than the, the wind plants will be for these utility scale projects which is good because you get some smoothing as those clouds go across the project, the project size will smooth it out. So you know, that helps in some cases. But you do have pretty sharp edges on these clouds where you'll lose you know, half of that intensity just when the cloud comes over you kind of thing pretty quickly. So you know, the difficulty with clouds is that, you know, especially on a partly cloudy day, uh, you know, it, you're not gonna know exactly where clouds are going to be at any instant in time. Trying to predict this day ahead is a, futile exercise, right? You can now predict kind of, okay, is this gonna be an overcast day? Is it gonna be a clear day? You know, is it gonna be partly cloudy? When do you expect the clouds to kind of start building up? And that's what this is showing, is that you can predict, you know, okay, in the morning it's gonna be overcast and uh, gonna have this, this hazy, you know, stratus deck. The sun will burn that off after a few hours. It'll become clear later in the, after, in the morning, right? 
and then it'll be clear for a while, and then you know, we think there's going to be some convective buildup over the afternoon. So you start getting the small cumulus clouds. There'll be lots of them, but they'll be small and relatively transparent. You know, so you see this high-speed noise. And then the, uh, the larger cumulus clouds or maybe thunderstorms will start developing later in the afternoon. Right? Typical sum summer sort of thing. This is typical summer in Florida pretty much every day. And that will create these you know, bigger but uh, less frequent gaps. So for day ahead, you know, if it's a partly cloudy situation, what we're after is predicting kind of that, that envelope of variability, right? Which is good because it allows you to look at, okay, what reserves would I set up for dealing with this tomorrow anyway? But you're not going to get it down to that cloud is going to go over your head at, you know, 123 tomorrow afternoon kind of stuff because clouds are very complex to predict. The other thing is, you, if you look at the clouds, uh, you've got... You know, you might have one layer of clouds at this height going this direction, another one going that way, right? I mean, they're, they're, some of them are ice crystals, some of them are actually, you know, water vapor. Uh, complicated to know exactly when they'll actually turn opaque on you. So if you're going to predict this, yes, sir, question. Is that loss in power due totally to the, uh, the change in radiation? Yeah. The shaded side shorts out the losing side. So, so the question is, is it, is it totally just from the irradiance or because of the, the way the panels are connected where if one is partially shaded, it might not have, it, you know, like might, might have zero power, even though the other half has sun on it, things like that? I mean, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of the early installs of these PV panels, actually, the way they did the wiring and the inverters, uh, they, uh, they would, could not tolerate like part of the array being shaded and part of it being in the sun. So that would make this even worse. Now with what they're doing with a lot of the work today with micro inverters, and we've got an expert here about inverters if you want to talk to him, uh, they're, they're getting away from that where they can wire them up so you can actually continue to get you know, partial output from each set of panels even if they're partially shaded. Uh, so most of it now is driven just by the, the irradiance of the sun. But yeah, you, you, can, you can do it in stupid ways that makes it even worse if you don't do the right electrical engineering. But you guys know that about electrical engineering in lots of other ways, right? Um, it's easy to make stupid mistakes. So if you want to forecast solar, uh, we'll talk about, yeah, you can use numerical weather models like we're talking about for wind. But suppose you want to do it just for the next 30 minutes or so. Well, I can stand right here and I can see the clouds, right? And I can kind of see which way they're going. And you can actually, for the next uh, 15 or maybe 30 minutes, depending on the speed of the clouds, you can use a direct observation type method called a total sky imager. This is one version of that, which is really just a reflective dome here and a camera taking a picture of that. And it gives you kind of a horizon to horizon picture. You can take that image, you can do signal processing on it, infer where the cloud edges are. You take snapshots of that, you can determine the motion of those clouds and figure out if it's headed your way and when it will come over you. But you can only do that for what you can see. And you can only, you know, clouds move often fairly, fairly fast. So that might work for 15, 20, 30 minutes, right? Beyond that, we still can take pictures of the clouds, but from space. And as long as it's a stable sort of cloud situation, meaning not like a thunderstorm that's just popping up in the middle of nowhere, you may be able to see this cloud out here. And this, the satellite images are every 15 or 30 minutes. You can determine the motion vector. And you can determine, well, when is that going to pass over the project here in Florida? And from that, you can get a forecast about you know, when this, this abrupt kind of cloud bank is going to come over me kind of thing. And you can, you can do pretty well with that. This tends to work the best out to about four or five hours. Okay? And then beyond that, you do have to get into this modeling of how well can I actually forecast, maybe not the exact you know, time of the incident, but you know, when is it going to happen? What part of this afternoon is going to start to get more partly cloudy? And, uh, there's a big project also funded by the Department of Energy now that's, that's looking at improving solar forecasting, just like we've been doing with wind forecasting. Solar, both for solar forecasting and I think solar technology in general is still several years behind wind in terms of its level of sophistication, but it's coming on very strong and it's going to benefit an awfully lot from what we've already figured out about you know, forecasting and integrating wind energy into the power system.
So the, the solar side, to sum up, uh, the clouds are the biggest influence. Uh, the convective events like thunderstorms are always going to be challenging because those can be, you know, we can forecast the probability of thunderstorms for the afternoon, but not exactly where they'll happen, right? Uh, these new weather models show promise in helping us do a better job of that. Uh, but the, the aerosols and the haze also have to be taken into account and, uh, and have some influence uh, on PV as well, but especially on concentrating technologies. So we mentioned that uh, a lot of the variability in these, these wind projects and the uncertainty of the wind forecast actually is benefited by aggreg aggregation. And the same is true with solar as well. Uh, for both of these technologies, aggregating it will get rid of up to about half of the variability and uncertainty just by pooling it together. Uh, with, you know, we'll see that this is significant, as we mentioned, with MISO. Uh, a couple of ways of looking at this. This is looking at you know, how correlated are wind projects as they move apart in distance. And it, it takes just a, you know, 100 miles or so, you start getting a, a lot of smoothing from wind, where they're not, the output of a wind plant here is not very correlated with one over there, a few counties away, even. Even more so with solar. Because a lot of that solar variability is driven by clouds and not by the larger air masses that we see with wind directly, just the difference between taking one location, which looks you know, really, really ugly, it's all over the place, if you have 16 locations of the same size that are just maybe even in the same couple of counties, a lot of that would smooth away pretty quickly. You know, so uh, you have to think about this in the context of load forecasting too. When we do load forecasting, we're not forecasting you know, individual residences or even neighborhoods a lot of the time. You do that over a large system, of course, the air goes way down. The same is true with wind and solar forecasts. Now the trick is, you know, if we're putting this into a market that we'll talk about later where we have to schedule it in at each individual project, you know, that's not helping us. That, that's helping MISO, you know, the system operator do this aggregation automatically, but we may be st still subject to penalties at every node. And also, I mentioned the smoothing. That uh, I mean, this this 25 megawatt project. The, the power out hit, you know, at the meter here is a lot smoother than it's going to be at any individual panel there. You know, so these these large projects actually have benefits. I mean, there are there are you know reasons why you get more smoothing from a larger project here, just like you would with a larger wind project. The other issue that we come up with is people say, well, is solar complementary to wind? You know, we talk about wind, well, wind doesn't produce as much in the afternoon in, on average, and solar obviously does pretty well in the afternoon. Solar doesn't do well at all at night. You know, we're very good at forecasting solar at night, but, uh, <laughs> but how complementary are these, right? And is there a weather basis for, for why they actually are complementary? And this goes back to the movie we saw there that, well, yeah, there is because you know, a, a low pressure system is when you're going to get a lot of those storm fronts that we talked about, giving energy to wind. But if there's a lot of storms, of course it's cloudy, you don't get much solar. A big high pressure system tends to be nice and sunny, but not a lot of storms going on, right? So it tends to, to be sunny, not, not as windy as we would in a storm season. And so these things are, you know, roughly, comp you know, complementary in a general sense. But how, how complementary are they on a specific sense? Uh, you know, well, let's look at this. This is just one example to kind of, kind of an extreme example. This is a, uh, a week of data, more or less, from the California heat wave in 2006. And the green line is the power output from their wind fleet, which at that point was only about 2,600 megawatts back in 2006. And you see this very strong diurnal pattern, right? It's, uh, the winds are peaking at night and they're going down in the afternoon and then back up at night again in this particular pattern they were in very dramatically. And the red dot is their peak load hour. And so what you see is that the winds definitely were not at their best at their peak load hour in the late afternoon. They weren't zero though, they were roughly 10% of the, uh, you know, the nameplate. So it wasn't, it wasn't zero, but uh, you know, the, so the, this was kind of the capacity value sort of approximation, right? You know, the contribution toward your critical hours. Uh, and often for wind, it's in that 10 to 20% sort of range, the way we calculate that. So if you had a whole bunch of solar about the same size here, say PV in the Mojave Desert near California, you know, what would that look like? Well, we simulated that from the solar data sets we have. 
And uh, a couple of things you notice. First, it, it definitely has just the opposite diurnal pattern. It's filling in those, those afternoon gaps very nicely. But the, the, the challenge with PV is that, of course, the sun starts going down before we usually hit a lot of our, our loads in the late afternoons a lot of these power systems. And I think, you know, here I think you've got a flatter load profile than a lot of the, the systems do. But uh, California, they don't hit their peak till you know, 5, 6 o'clock in the afternoon sometimes. And, of course, the sun is starting to go down already. So if you look at, you know, where was solar at those peak hours, you know, its capacity value contribution was actually not much different than wind because of the timing of this. Now, obviously, those, those, afternoon, those, those other afternoon hours may have been more valuable as well because they were also high load, but they weren't the peak load yet. So this gets people, of course, thinking about, well, is it, is it better to use like a, a thermal solar, concentrating thermal that might have more inertia in there because of all the steam I'm producing going through the, the whole power plant or get into some storage? There's a little bit of storage help. Uh, and obviously it would. Uh, again, it's a cost-benefit trade-off. Are you going to spend the money on storage that extends your hours out maybe to cover your peak? But, you know, is that worth it given the, the relatively high cost of storage these days and things like that? So they are, they are roughly complementary. Uh, you know, neither may be ideal, but then uh, you know, there's, there's going to be impacts of uh, integrating this, as we'll, we'll talk about as well. Any questions on that? This is more looking at it kind of from a utility scale side. Does that, does that um, variability in the, uh, the wind, does that kind of ripple through the LMPs? Do they they reflect the yeah, the question is, uh, th does this ripple into your markets in terms of uh, LMP pricing in these power markets? It, it does sometimes because uh, obviously uh, wind and solar are, have a very low marginal operating cost. They have no fuel cost, right? Which is their advantage and, and why they're a fuel hedge, you know, long term as well. Uh, but they tend to bid into the market, you know, at, uh, at zero or negative prices. Uh, if they have a, like a production tax credit, they'll actually bid in negative uh, because they, they can only get that credit when they're producing and selling energy. Uh, so there, there can be cases where, uh, especially if the forecast is wrong, you know, and you get more wind energy than you expected, that can have a, a price influence in real time. And so you do see that. Uh, Alberta sees it a lot because they're a really small contained market, and they basically got wind and they got coal, you know, and when, uh, when the wind blows, the power price falls in their real-time market. The next thought comes to me, well, somebody gets the, the same prediction model and can predict when the wind is going to, and, and schedules their load around that. You know, they, they kind of right. Question is, can you, with their load to try to can you, can you actually follow load and do that? Uh, you, off the low, low cost hour. Well, this, yeah, we, we'll get to talk more about this when we get in the market stuff in just a moment, but yeah, you, you're going to see a lot of that with, uh, like, like demand response starts to make a lot of sense, right? Uh, participating loads. If you can better align your, your load with when you have cheap energy, you know, obviously it's going to be beneficial. But uh, all this interacts with each other when we get in the market systems, and we'll talk about that. Very, very interesting, I think, about how we can uh, adjust our markets to better integrate and accommodate all these, uh, these characteristics. The other thing that's been a, a big issue here recently is, you know, we, it's, it's great to have these big solar plants that look like, like power plants. But what about this distributed stuff that's usually behind the meter? It's down on the distribution side. You know, it's not a big plant. We don't have uh, like a, a meter on it. We, we don't curtail it uh, when we need to. Uh, we don't see a lot of it because it's often the distribution feeder feeding back at us as you get enough of this up through the, the feeders and the transformers, right? It's an interesting case. Uh, you know, initially I was uh, certainly very much just saying, you know, why would you do distributed solar? Because uh, utility scale solar, it's always going to be really cheaper to build because you've got the economies of scale. You're building a big project rather than lots of little ones. You've got the visibility because we can afford to put good metering on it. You've got the control if you need it because you can run it just like a power plant or like a large wind plant. Uh, you, know, you know, it looks like a, a conventional power plant, right, if we wanted to. Whereas distributed solar, you know, it's, uh, you know you're not even going to own most of it. It's going to be owned by, you know, usually by the residents or the company, there's, been, there's a lot of commercial and industrial stuff going on in the roofs of Walmarts and Ikeas and, uh, you know, coal stores and all that right now. Uh, 
it, it's nice because it's distributed, but it's out there and it's, it's usually done under a net metering relationship where it's, it's basically lowering their load, you know, their, their, their energy purchases, but in a way that we often can't even see, right? So it's difficult to predict what's going to happen. And often we're putting it down on the distribution side in a system that was not really built to accept a lot of new generation. Uh, so what happens when that power starts flowing back upstream and the system was not designed to do that? What happens if you get so much of this out on a feeder that it just uh, you know, requires feeder upgrades and, and transformer and substation upgrades? So we've got these local impacts. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk uh, more about that in, in a little bit later when we get into the rules. But you know, this is a very interesting area right now because there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of political and policy pull for this. Uh, and in Minnesota, we'll talk about too, we've got a new legislation that just is going to take effect right now. Very important. I'll talk about the details of that in a minute because I'm starting to believe you're, you're not going to really stop this. You're not going to slow this down. There's lots of reasons why people want to do this even though it is more expensive. And we have to figure out how we're going to deal with that uh, in the power system. So keep that in mind. Before we go to the details of that, I want to talk about, uh, make sure people have the, the foundation here about operations and integrating renewables. And I think a lot of you, now most of you here in the room are, are obviously your, your, your employees of uh, the, the utility here, but uh, most of you on the operations side, I know some are not, some are in management or uh, do we have any people more on the finance or policy or mostly engineering? Mostly engineers, huh? Okay, gotcha. Well, I can go pretty quickly over some of this. But you know, you know, the, the job number one is keep the lights on, but we've also got to maintain this balance between uh, generation load. And that means we've got to have not just energy, we need other reserves and supporting services to deal with reliability on this, right? We come into this with a perception, you know, that, uh, uh, that it's difficult. And I, I'm a big believer in, you know, you've got to find an elegant point of view on things if you're going to come up with a really efficient solution, right? In fact, I had a, a business partner once, a software guy. I could never tell him what to do. I only had to tell him, I'd love it if it behaved like this. And he wouldn't do anything at all for weeks. And then he'd come in Monday morning and say, oh, yeah, here you go, Mark. It only took 10 lines of code. But I had to think about it for three weeks before I came up with the right elegant solution. You know? So that's kind of what we're talking about here. I mean, yeah, you drove a lot of people nuts. But I just figured out how to deal with it eventually. You know? <laughs> So a perception is reality here. We've got you know, to know that we've had this perception. We've been very comfortable with decades of learning about how to perceive all these other conventional plants. And now we've got this crazy stuff like wind and solar. Can we find a more elegant way of looking at this problem? Of course, the initial impression of a lot of control room guys, and I don't blame them a bit, is that, you know, God, my load forecast is bad enough. Now you're adding wind and solar here. It just you know, makes it that much harder. How can I even view them as a power plant if I don't control them and dispatch them? Why can't they give me a perfect forecast like I get from everybody else? You know, and OK, fine, I'll take them, but I'm going to set aside a fixed amount of reserves to cover my worst case situation, and you're just going to have to pay for it, right? Which is, you know, you'd understand this is an initial state. Uh, I don't blame them. But you know, what, we're, what we're finding is that you have to look at this the right way. I mean, as I mentioned, I don't consider wind and solar to be intermittent so much as variable, right? Because there is a difference, I think, in perception. And you have to look at, OK, how fast is this variability? Uh, you know, is, it, is it the largest contingency, like a, like a transmission line might be? Or, or usually not, because you know, usually these changes are relatively slow. In fact, some of the problems we have is a lot of these changes, especially with wind, are so slow that it wouldn't even qualify as a contingency event that would allow us to use reserves under a lot of our rules. Right? If there's a big forecast error, is that a contingency event or not? Right? Depends on the system. But it turns out there's a lot of ways. Uh, we've done a lot of integration studies now, both across the state, across the nation. And you come up with some, some ways of dealing with this that really work well. I mean, I've, I've just you know, dwelled endlessly on this balancing area. You need a larger pool, a larger balancing area. We'll smooth a lot of this out. Uh, it turns out also if you can do faster intra-hour adjustments and move all this closer to real time, obviously we're getting where the forecast is better. We can track those changes with more granular steps. That helps a lot. But we are going to get to the point where we need to look at how much system flexibility do we have? Can the rest of the system ramp fast enough to deal with this? How are we going to deal with that sort of, sort of issue? And can we start using, you know, adjust the load to provide some of this flexibility? Are there ways of doing that as part of our system? And what about storage? Do we need storage for this? 
you know, or, or is it just kind of a nice to have at the right price kind of thing? Of course, I think you're familiar, I'll, I'll talk here about, you know, regulation is the, the reserve service, you know, the ancillary service for just the next few seconds or minutes. And then load following will often be like a five minute time step of how we dispatch our units to, uh, to change. And then the scheduling day ahead is usually an hour by hour sort of day ahead plan, right? How you run a power system. And uh, the, the challenge is that, okay, you start out, suppose you got a system that has a daily load profile like this. Now we're very comfortable today knowing while well, we're gonna run our nuclear units and our coal units, we got some hydro, and then we got gas, uh, combined cycle gas plants that run you know, pretty efficiently. And then we got some gas peakers we can start up and ramp faster maybe, right? And all this is great. So we take that same load profile, and, and by the way, we have like regulation to fine tune it, do the final balancing, right? So that's great, we're used to that. Very nice plan. So now the same load profile, we just add in a bunch of wind, and we look at the net load that has to be followed by the conventional units. And we lay those on here and we say, okay, well, you know, gosh, what, what changes here? Well, some pretty big things actually change here. Uh, some of our, you know, basically baseload units aren't baseload anymore. They now have to be ramped or even shut down parts of the day. So we might be doing more starts and stops or ramping there. Uh, it's gonna change maybe how steep these ramps are. They, they may be a, a faster ramp rate than we ever saw before because wind might be falling off just when load is picking up kind of stuff, right? So it just makes the ramp even that much, much steeper. And oh, by the way, look at that. We need those gas peakers even more than before because we've got all this, this variability going on, but they're only gonna produce about you know, maybe a third of the energy they did before. So if they get paid in the energy market, how are they gonna have enough revenue to even stay in business to provide that service if we're using up a lot of that energy, replacing that with cheaper wind and solar energy, right? So it's pretty disruptive. Uh, and, and of course, you know, we get worried about, well, if I'm ramping these coal plants more than before, does that increase my O&M costs? You know, what about the, the, the life of these units that are now being you know, subject to thermal stresses at a different level? And uh, do I know that enough where I can even reflect that into the bids that I put into the market with this? You know, how am I going to accommodate that sort of issue? There's a lot of good engineering problems here. In fact, we've had this nice kind of simplified view of the world where you got base load and mid-merit and peaker plants. And variability actually is imposed on, on all of these. It's not just the peakers kind of stuff. Uh, it changes everything in the system in terms of this, this and really forces us eventually here as we get to these higher levels to think about this problem, not in terms of this nice little uh, layered model, but it's much more of a balancing issue. How do I optimize the entire system? And that may force us to th step back and find an entirely different elegant approach to do this better, right? Because our traditional way of looking at it might not be the most optimal solution for this or the, the most elegant. So these best practices that have come out of here, as we talked about, you know, larger areas, shorter scheduling, committing as close to real time as you can with some units, and demand response storage all help. But, you know, wind plants have to do their job too. In fact, I, I never call it, I, I hope so far I've never mentioned that the term wind farm, because I hate the term wind farm. I always say they're wind power plants today. They're wind plants, they're not wind farms, because they have to start acting like power plants, right? We have to do a very good forecast the best we can. We have to integrate that somehow into the next day unit commitment optimization plan. If we don't do that and we just let wind energy show up that wasn't in the plan, our whole optimal day ahead plan is blowing, right? So you gotta at least put the best forecast you can in the day ahead optimization. You know, I think renewables have to be submitting a schedule. It's good if they do a centralized forecast, but you know, all power plants submit their own schedule, you know, so they should be at least financially putting in their own schedules. And I think they have to follow dispatch just like everybody else. Those are somewhat controversial wor words with some of the folks in the wind community, but you know, if we're really gonna get where we have a lot of wind, it has to look enough like a power plant that we can get it into all of our tools and our markets. Otherwise, we can't optimize the system or run the market, right? And then we're also, you know, this flexibility I mentioned, this is getting to be pretty interesting right now because, uh, you know, it's not like flexibility is a new issue. We've always had to have it for load and other forecast uncertainties, but we probably are gonna need more of it, or at least we're going to make sure we have more of it at the points and times where we might be impacted by a big wind or solar ramp, right? 
And so do we need to start considering uh, ramping constraints in dispatch? MISO is actually starting to do that right now, where they're, they're, they're probably going to put in a slight adjustment to their five-minute dispatch. And we'll talk more about you know, dispatch if you're not familiar with that. But they're just saying, you know, instead of, instead of like turning on my cheapest plant uh, and using it for energy when it's also a very flexible plant, do I want to hold that back so I, I've got that flexibility when I see this ramp coming in 20 minutes uh, and keep that flexibility for later and maybe pay them to make them whole in that energy market? But, you know, make sure I reserve the more flexible plants that I have for when I'm going to have value for them and figure out how they're paid for that. Or should there be a whole new ancillary product for flexibility? Because the sort of ramping flexibility we're talking about here, it's not regulation. It's not the second to second stuff. You know, and it's not really a standard reserves problem where it's a contingency. It's I might need more ramping than I can get out of my regular five minute dispatch. Do I want to create a new product to, to pay people, create a new revenue stream to encourage people to build more flexible plants or to upgrade their plants to be more flexible? Right? And California is talking about products like that. And flexibility planning. You know, how do I actually tell people that five years from now, once I'm at these new uh, portfolio standard levels, I'm going to value more flexibility? Well, how do I tell somebody, give them that signal soon enough that they can actually build new you know, gas plants, for example, that are going to have the flexibility, how are they going to get paid for that? Are we going to do that with a, a flexible capacity payment of some sort? You know, these are the sorts of things that are very, uh, very much in discussion right now, especially, I mean, California is deep into this with their high levels of renewables, but we're going to see it everywhere in the country. Fortunately, you know, there's lots of sources of flexibility out there. It's not just our generators. You know, it's how we use our transmission. It's uh, gas turbines, there's new, new technologies for gas. Some of the CT plants out there are amazing, you know, if, they, if we can afford them. Uh, the load, the demand response we talked about. Uh, uh, PJM in the east, you know, they've got several thousand megawatts of demand response bidding into their market right now, and they use it all the time, right? And they pay it, you know, the, the same price as energy out there. Energy storage could be great uh, if it's at the right price, but you know, we can also ramp gas plants and get a lot of the same services. So it's how does energy storage compete with other alternatives? A big part of it, in my view, is operational markets though, because as we'll see in a moment, a fairly subtle change in a market rule can make a big difference on, on how much flexibility you have and how you get participation in that market. So uh, we're going to see a lot of activity with market rules. There's also, by the way, uh, you know, you're all hearing about you know, smart grid and all the uh, advanced meters we're putting out there. Uh, part of that now is growing what they call a transactive energy type approach, which is saying, well, we might not be able to get variable pricing down every home, but there could be value in having pricing signals out there so that intelligent devices or loads can actually start reacting to that in some way. And it's something to keep in mind if you're more in the smart grid side of the world. So is storage really needed? I mean, I, I commonly still hear people say, you know, well, there, there's no way we can do 30% wind unless we have massive amounts of utility scale storage on the system. And I cringe every time I hear that because uh, it'd be nice if it was the cheapest way of getting the flexibility. Do you need it? You know, it's not a requirement. In fact, they've done a lot of these large integration studies uh, have been done by folks like GE, you know, looking at this. They're, they're looking at very high levels, like 30 or 40 percent wind and solar, like on the Western Interconnect or the Eastern Interconnect. They have not yet found a case where you can actually pay for new storage, even like pumped hydro storage, based on the price differential between uh, peak off peak prices or the ancillary service costs that they can see so far. You know, so it's difficult to make that case. Now, at the right price, if, it's, if it becomes cheap, you know, if there's good breakthroughs, it's going to be wonderful. And there might actually be some cases like on the distributed PV side where it might make sense to put in a little bit of storage in a neighborhood or, you know, what you're, what you're doing there is you're deferring a very expensive upgrade of the transmission or distribution system or a generator build. So from deferred cost point of view, it might make sense, but that might be temporary too. So, you know, if I say, well, if you find put in storage, but keep it in the trailer, because as soon as you do that upgrade, it's going to have no value. You're going to have to move it someplace else. You know, so it'd be interesting to see. Uh, there's talk about new combined, like uh, compressed air storage uh, project in California, early discussion of that. You know, it might happen. It's going to be part of the mix. But uh, the, the problem is just the cost benefit with storage. I'm not against it at all. It's just that, uh, you know, 
uh, ramping a gas plant is also storage in a sense, right? If we save that fuel for later and we get that flexibility. So that's the price you have to compete with if you're building a storage project. It doesn't make sense, by the way, to think about trying to firm you know, every individual wind or solar project with storage, because that's what the power system is for. We get, you know, we get this flexibility much more cheaply from our power system as a whole than we do off of trying to turn everything into flat blocks. You know, and, and integrating flat blocks is not the solution either, because they have sharp edges that have ramps. So. Any questions so far? Now we get into the, the really fun stuff that I like. <laughs> Now, you're saying, how did a guy that basically has a background in none of this stuff ever get into markets? And I said, well, it, it all fits together, as you see, because it, you know, forecasting gets you into scheduling, scheduling gets you into operations and markets, and then you get into market design about how do you align all this stuff. So that's what we're going to talk about next. Are we okay to, should we take a break here, or you want to? Okay. Want to take a short break here?